<laughs> this is Dr. Tara Rye Trench. She is one of the most extraordinary women currently walking the planet. Let me just put it that simply. Uh -huh. um, she comes from uh, a world away um, and has messages for us in our modern world that are every bit as relevant now as ever. Um, she grew up in what used to be Rhodesia and is now Zimbabwe. Came from a very poor, um, culturally fascinating, um, culturally rich, but materially poor um, mm -hmm. rural village and um, was married off by the time she was 14, had delivered four children by the time she was 18, and became the most unlikely and amazing advocate for education, having achieved her dreams, which I will let you tell about, tell about um, including getting her doctorate um, after a beginning that would have led you to believe that nothing of the sort could have ever happened. Um, and she's here today to talk about the power of dreaming, the power of supporting women's lives, um, the power of sisterhood, and the power of her extraordinary perseverance. Um, so Dr. Trent, welcome again. <laughs> oh, thank, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. You, you know, you are my icon. I have followed you for many, many years and read some of your work. I think you are such a brilliant writer. Yeah, oh, it's I, it's an honor to be in your presence. I 100% guarantee you that the honor is entirely mine. <laughs> oh, thank you. I can assure you of that. And um, and I invited you today um, onto the onto this show, the IG show, um, because I wanted to discuss and and I had assigned everybody to read your book, The Awakened Woman. Such an extraordinary, such a beautiful book. And and if you'll do us the honor to begin by reading from the introduction and giving us a little bit of your, in your own words, the background of your extraordinary life. Thank you, thank you. The Kore Kore people are indigenous farmers with a rich spiritual culture. We believe that our world and all that exists begins with the supreme being and creator, an invisible spirit presiding over heaven and earth, whom we refer to as Mwari Musikavanu or Onyadenga, which in translation generally means he who is God, the great one, the one who created people or the great spirit. Individuals cannot access God and so our elders seek advice and guidance from God through Adzimu, or ancestral spirits. These invisible guardians, our ancestors, are the cornerstones of our spiritual life, as well as a source of comfort and protection, especially during illness. It is these ancestors to whom we pray for protection when the Wurungwe rambles. Like most native Zimbabweans, the Kore Kore way of life is organized around our belief in collective duty for the survival of all. There is an unspoken rule that obligates individuals to a moral responsibility to work for a common goal. All things being equal, the community and the ancestors protect individuals in their rights. As children, we learn early on that we belong not only to our families, but also to our neighbors. As such, neighbors have the same rights and responsibilities as family members to instill good manners in the village children. It is believed that an individual's behavior, good or bad, affects the wholeness of the society. As children, while having so much adult supervision, had grave consequences when we misbehave, but it also gave us a sense of security and belonging. Very often neighbors bring food or cook food for children when their mothers are away. Despite the beauty of our collectiveness, other powers within the environment threatened our way of life. Mm. The British colonized Zimbabwe in 1888 and communities like ours were forcibly resettled from our ancestral lands to this in commodious territory when the harsh terrain was determined to be unsuitable for European colonists. Demarcated by the European settlers as a native reserve in 1913, Urungwe became one of the largest Come back. <laughs> Oh no. 
it's frozen again. Right a pity. Oh, technology. Ah, she's back. <laughs> Sorry, we lost you for one second, but you're back now. <laughs> our, our village has struggled with disease, poverty, and a lack of basic resources such as clean water, electricity, health care, education, and at times food for decades. I have seen how volatile things happen when poverty and an oppressive colonial system interlock with existing norms of a traditionally patriarchal society. Women and girls, although powerful keepers of our wisdom and collective memory in Kore Kore culture, were devalued by a clan system that gave men power over disputes and decision making and marriage practices like polygamy and wife inheritance. On to this reality, the oppressive colonial system layered the denial of our dignity and sources of subsistence, shaping and extending inequality among the community. being patient and hoping that she comes back. On to this reality, the oppressive colonial system layered the denial of our dignity and sources of subsistence, shaping and extending inequality among the community. We were sitting on a powder keg. When the war for liberation broke out during my youth, my people were already strained by these patriarchal and colonial forces, and we grew divided. When the war, when the war for liberation broke out during my youth, my people who were already strained by these patriarchal and colonial forces grew divided. Families were forced to divulge family secrets. Communities were torn apart when they disagreed on which side to support or based on whose children had joined either the freedom fighters or the Rhodesian army. Women and girls became casualties of war that started before some of their mothers were even born. While all women and girls were in danger of sexual violence as soldiers passed through their homesteads, unmarried young women and girls were the most vulnerable. Rather than have their daughters sexually abused, fathers and clan leaders forced very young women into marriage as a kind of protection. It was within this background that I, Terry Rai, hardly 14 years of age, had my first child. By 18 years of age, I had birthed four children. Thank you, Terry Rai. Thank you for persisting despite New York City's sirens and technology. And I think you might have touched a button that turned your phone so that the camera's not on you right now. It's on maybe the wall across from you. Um, and there should be a little, if you look on the upper left, there you are. Perfect. There you are. I want you to know that everything that, that you just did with this, I did the first time that I did Instagram Live as well. <laughs> it's all part of the learning process. And it's yeah. Um, and, and, it's, and thank you so much for reading this. Um, your story, there's a story that I've heard you tell, and, and I... And I wanted to see whether I could, could ask you to tell it to us again today. And you've set the stage for it now as having been born into a world that was really a perfect storm for the mm -hmm. oppression of girls and women. A world where there was a deep spiritual, um, cultural richness that had been undercut by colonialism, by poverty, by uh, intentional poverty, um, yeah. by an oppressive system, by the deepening of patriarchy and into this world came you. Yeah. And you speak about the baton of 
that, that, that there was a race that the women in your ancestry were running over time. Mm. Mm. And they were passing a baton back and forth, forward into each generation, a baton of poverty. And I was wondering if you could speak about that and about where that ended with you and how. So I, I come from this long line of generations of women, women who had been denied their right to education, women who had been devalued. So I always visualized my great grandmother when she was born. She was born into this race that I call the relay race of poverty. And she's born holding this baton and I'm calling that the baton of early marriage, the baton of a colonial system that never respected her as a, as a woman, the baton of abuse, the baton of illiteracy. And she's running with this, with this baton in this race, and she runs and she hands over this baton of illiteracy, the baton of poverty, the baton of a colonial system to my grandmother. My grandmother grabs this baton and she runs with this baton of illiteracy, the baton of this ugly colonial system that oppressed the black people. And she runs and she hands over this baton to my mother. My mother grabs the same baton and she's running, she's running and she hands over that baton to me. And I ran with this baton for some time, but I reached a point where I dropped that baton. I just said, this is just bullshit. I'm not going to run with this baton. I have to define my own life. And so I dropped that baton and pursued the baton of education. But my grandmother would tell the story that we are not victims of this baton. In the running of this baton, in the passing of this baton, there is also the passing of wisdom. Mm. It is believed that the descendants of people who lived hardships are likely to pass on their trauma to the next generation. But in that epigenetics learning, there is also the passing on of wisdom. So I chose to pick the wisdom because the country had become so free and there were so many opportunities. And that's when I, by the time I was 18, as I read, I was already a mother of four and one of the babies died as an infant because I failed to produce enough milk. I was a child myself, but, but all I wanted was an education. Can you tell us about that? that remarkable day um, that your life began to transform. Yeah. One of many pieces, not, nobody's life changes in one day or due to one person, um, but one of, the, I think you know the day that I'm speaking of. Yeah, so, when, uh, so, so in that period of my, of my darkness in my life, I, I would meet a woman who came to the village and I, and I didn't even know her name. Later on, I learned her name was Jolak. And she found me seated in a circle with other women. And she asked this one question that was so profound in my life. No one had asked me that question. What are your dreams? What are your hopes? And I was quiet. The other women talked about their dreams to educate their children. And I was just quiet. She looked at me and she said, young woman, you are silent. Please tell me what are your dreams? And I remember when I opened my mouth, I became a chatterbox <laughs> because I knew I had these dreams, but I didn't know how to explain, to verbalize those dreams because I didn't think women are supposed to have dreams in this life. So I said, I want to go to America. I want to have an undergraduate degree. I want to have a master's and I want to have a PhD. There was silence. The women were looking at me like I was crazy. And I could imagine they were thinking, how can you say that? Look at you. You are expecting your number five hours pregnant, your number no. five child. You have no high school education. And what are you going to do about your abusive husband how are you, you you think of going to america let alone a phd and the woman joe like she looked at me and she said if you believe in those dreams they are achievable 
and she used the word tinogona. In my language, it means it is achievable. That's all I wanted to hear as a poor woman. And I, and I always tell women that sometimes we need these mentors, these heroes who can look into our eyes and just give us hope. And that's all I needed. And I ran to my mother and I said, mother, I met someone who made me believe in my dreams. My mother say, Tererai, if you truly believe in what this woman, this stranger has said to you, and let's say you work hard and you achieve your dreams, not only are you defining who you are as a woman, but you are defining every life that comes out of your womb and generations to come. My mother knew that I needed to break that vicious cycle of poverty to break that baton and never to pass on that baton that silences many women never to pass it on to my girls and to my children mm -hmm. so my mother said so i wrote down those dreams and my mother said uh, uh write those dreams and bury them the same way we bury the umbilical cord i come from a culture where when a child is born the female elders of the village the librarians of our memories they would snip out the birth code the birth code or the umbilical cord and tie it in an old cloth and bury the contents deep down under the ground with the belief that when this child grows wherever they go the umbilical cord will always remind them of their birthplace so my mother said write down your dreams and bury them despite the abuse in your life the challenges that you face your dreams will always remind you of their importance so mm. when my mother read those dreams she realized i only had four to go to America, undergraduate, master's, and PhD. And she said, Tererai, I only see your four personal dreams, but remember, I want you to remember this, my daughter, your dreams will have greater meaning when they are tied to the betterment of your community. Your dreams will have greater meaning when they are tied to the greater good. And I would end up writing my number five dream goal when i'm done i want to come back and improve the lives of women and girls in my community i had no idea what that meant maybe i just wanted to please my mother and i buried those dreams it would take me eight years eight freaking years <laughs> to achieve my high school education I and that wasn't anything. even on the list of dreams no, it wasn't. It took eight years to get to a place where you could even begin the list. Yes, yes. Because I, <laughs> I knew I was on a journey to change the trajectory of my, of my life. Yeah. No matter how much time it was going to take, I was going to do it. And I, you know, because I couldn't go to a classroom, so I would do correspondence. And I would, my mother was very poor. She was a subsistence farmer. So I needed about five subjects, math, English, science, uh, a local language, geography, to qualify for me even to start thinking about doing an undergraduate program. Yeah. And I, I would take two, three uh, classes at a time because my mother would grow tomatoes and um, sell mangoes or whatever vegetables. And I would go and write and in that writing process, because we're still under the British colonial system of education, I would send my paperwork to this place called Cambridge. And I had no idea where Cambridge is. And I would wait three to six months oh. for those results to come back. And they would always come in a brown envelope. And I would open that brown envelope and I would realize I have a U ungraded. I have a F, F failure. And I would go back to my mother and I said, Mother, I failed. My mother would say, No, we'll sell more vegetables. She would sell and, and give me some money. And I would go back 
and I would open that brown envelope after six months and I would still have a U and graded and I would go back to my mother and I'm crying and my mother said, no, we don't cry. We do what we have to do. I'll sell more mangoes and more guavas for you. And she would do that. Eight years, I opened that brown envelope. I had A's and B's. My grandmother would tell me that, Tererai, you need to go to this place where you have buried your dreams. Visualize as though you have already achieved those dreams. Mm. Feel the ages of those dreams. Touch those dreams. Live as though you are already living the life you deserve. So I would go to this place where I had buried my dreams and I would sit and visualize myself getting into an aeroplane. And remember, I had never seen an aeroplane in my life. The only aeroplane that I knew were the war helicopters that used to come into the mm. community. And I would see that war helicopter and visualize myself getting into that helicopter, finding a seat and visualize myself getting into this place called America, mm. going to a university holding books. And I remember the day that I received a letter from Oklahoma State University, an acceptance letter. It was one of those, the happiest memory I uh. have. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and when I went on to the aeroplane, to the airport to get into that aeroplane, Getting in and finding a seat, there was this deja vu feeling like I've been here before. Uh. I've been here before. And so when I arrived in Oklahoma and seeing myself carrying a backpack and attending classes, it was a dream come true. Uh. And many have asked me, Tererai, where did you get that determination and I think the determination was I didn't want to pass on the ugly baton yeah and I grew up in a culture where they talk of these two hungers that we have in our lives there is the little hunger it's all about immediate gratification I want it now I want it now it's all about fame if I can only be famous, if I can only have money and be famous, it's all about attention. That's the little hunger. But the great hunger, the greatest of all hungers in our lives, is hunger for meaning. And I wanted meaning in my life. Then people ask me, how do we get the great hunger? By asking yourself, what breaks my heart? Because it is in those moments of our brokenness, we become more creative. And we see it even in this pandemic. Many of us are now learning about Instagram, which we didn't even know. <laughs> For instance. <laughs> <laughs> so there is always a gift in adversity. Yeah. And so here I was at Oklahoma, achieving my undergraduate in agriculture and went on to do my, my master's. But it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. Because later on, I brought my, my children. And I didn't have scholarship because I was an adult student and I was an international student and I couldn't qualify for, for scholarship. So we relied mostly on me working three jobs. I used to clean houses. I used to work for um, restaurants, go to these restaurants and work. And I, I remember every time when um, people have eaten their food, whatever leftovers, I would ask my colleagues, can you beg the food for me so I can feed the children? But they reached a time when the food wasn't enough. And I remember going to the university and I asked the 
Vice President of International Student, Dr. Ron Beer. And I said, it's one thing for me to pursue a dream, but it's another to see my children suffering. I need, I need food because I'm realizing when my kids are brushing their teeth, their gums are bleeding mm. because they are missing fruits and vegetables. In Africa, back home, we can grow our fruits and vegetables everywhere and feed the children. Now the children were eating the French fries and, and ham, hamburgers and it wasn't good for their teeth. And so the university said, oh, I hope you don't mind uh, if we ask the local uh, stores, sometimes they throw away um, fruits that are going bad and vegetables. I hope you don't mind feeding your kids. And I said, no, I don't mind. So we went to this store and the store manager said, no, in America, you don't do that because if we give you these leftover fruits and vegetables, you consume them. And if anything happens to your kids or to you, you might end up suing us. And I said, I have no dime to sue anyone, please. And I'm crying. <laughs> the last crying. thing on your mind. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and the guy is also crying. I mean, I could see he had tears in his eyes. And he said, mm. well, well, stop it, stop it. Um, I'm going to, instead of handing you the fruits and vegetables, I'm going to um, place them in a cardboard box and make sure that uh, we place that cardboard box outside uh, the, the store because we can't give it to you, but we are going to put it near the trash can. Make sure that four o'clock, you are here to pick your, 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 your fruits and vegetables and go and feed the kids. Uh, but make sure you come four because the trash can will be carried over it by four o'clock. So I would always be late because, you know, I was working three jobs and taking care of uh, five kids and it, was, it wasn't easy. I would always be late to that trash can and find the cardboard box had already been placed into inside the trash can and some of the fruits are already spilling over. I would grab everything, wash and feed the kids and ask myself, who am I to even complain that my kids are eating fruits and vegetables from the trash can when I know there are thousands, if not millions of kids out of Sub-Saharan Africa who are eating from dirty trash cans that no one is washing, at least the American trash can, someone washes it. And who mm -hmm. am I even to complain that I live with my kids in a trailer house where we have no electricity and it was just horrible when it rains. I find myself with the kids in a corner. Who am I to complain when I know there are many women in the Western world that I could see they were on the streets without any shelter. At least I could see my dreams. I could see the achievement of my dreams. So when I graduated with my master's, I, I knew I needed to take a break. I, you know, my kids were going hungry and I needed to work. And I applied for a job and got accepted at a place called uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. And I remember getting this job and one day I'm walking through the corridors and I see this woman and she says, I think I know you. And I'm thinking, well, I've met so many white women. <laughs> 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 and I'm just talking to myself and said, I, I think I know you, aren't you from Zimbabwe? And it just dawned on me, yes, this was Joe Luck the woman who I had met some 16 years ago, and now here she is, she is the CEO and president the of Hefa International. The one your eyes and said, what is, what is your dream? Yes, that, that woman. And when I met her, she was, I believe she was a program officer or some other position. She wasn't this big CEO and uh, president of the organization. And uh, she said, I... I've always been thinking about you. I knew your dreams um, and I know you still need to do your PhD. So my job, because it required me to travel all over the world. And uh, the first trip was to go to Africa and I went to that place where I had buried my dreams, dug them up, check going to America, check undergraduate, <laughs> check masters and reburied those dreams. You know, the word bury and plant are the same in my language. Mm. 
Yeah, yeah. So I was planting my dreams. Mm. And so when I came back um, from, from Africa, I, I enrolled myself at Western Michigan University where I would achieve my uh, PhD in evaluations, which was a lot of statistics and measurements for an old woman like me. And remember, <laughs> remember when I was taking my classes, I was always the uh, oldest student and sometimes older than the professor herself or himself. But I never cared because I knew I was on a journey to break this cycle and never to pass on this ugly baton, but to reshift and redefine, to be recreative, to create a different baton that I wanted to pass on to my kids. It would, yeah. you know, the day that they said I was about to, to graduate my, you know, from, you know, my, my PhD. And um, uh, I, I remember walking that, you know, stadium, you know, in, in the stadium and, um, that platform where you see those professors wearing their big heads and uh, yeah. they're handing you that paper and there is big celebration. It dawned on me that it had taken me 20 years from the day that I had buried my dreams to the day that I was getting this PhD. I felt like a lawyer who had rested her case to the world and my closing argument was, if we give education opportunities to those who are torn down and marginalized by the social ills of our time, they can achieve their dreams. If we give education opportunities to women and girls, it is the best investment any country, any community, any individual could do because women and girls are the healers of this world. Women and girls are going to change this world. Education, the lack of education silences many women and girls and we should be able to give them these opportunities. So, <laughs> so, now, I have my, so now I have my PhD, you would think I would be happy. And I am thinking, dear mother, why, why did you make me write that number five dream why can't she just... knew that, that 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 was the most important one the fifth dream i know and yeah. why can't i just be happy right and, and you know i i realized that my my mother uh, was a very smart woman because uh i then got a phone call you know but i had started selling t-shirts because i was like the 50 go i need to go back and build schools give back to my communities and I had no idea. And so I made these t-shirts and had a design, Tinogona, it is achievable. That word that I had, you know, had heard from Joe Luck, it is achievable. And I sold those t-shirts and mostly to my American friends. There were only 20 t-shirts that were sold. Is that enough to build a school? No. <laughs> As it turns out? <laughs> no. I was devastated. I was devastated and I kept on thinking about that buried dream, the number five, and realized when I got this phone call from Oprah Winfrey, the most memorable call of my life, when she donated 1.5 million US dollars towards that fifth dream that she didn't even know. She asked me, what are your dreams now? And I said, I want to give back to my community so the girls and women don't have to go through what I had gone through. I want to build a school. And so she said, I'm donating 1.5 million so you can go and fulfill that dream. And I realized my mother was so right. My mother was so wise. She knew that it's not about the education for me. It wasn't about the education. It's not about our personal goals in life or even our personal financial goals in life, but it is about how we connect the education, how we connect our personal goals to the greater good. That's what makes us 
successful in this life. And so today, with the help of Oprah, and um, she brought in an organization, Save the Children, who managed all the funding. Um, we built that one school. And after that relationship with Save the Children ended, uh, I was left with these high expectations because these kids were now educated in primary education. They needed to go to high school. They needed to go to university. So I started my speaking and um, providing tuitions to these kids. And today we are now uh, building number 12 school. We now have 12 schools uh, benefiting 38,000 kids that have gone through our education system. And many of the girls that are now attending universities, their mothers and their grandmothers never attended uh, college. And uh, some of them never even went even up to primary education. And now they are the first ones never to pass on that baton. And that really encouraged me to write the book, The Awakened Woman. For those of you just joining us, we've been talking to Dr. Teradai Trent about her book, The Awakened Woman. Oh, so many things to say. What? One thing that I want to that I want to talk about is something that I heard you say in an interview when you were talking about the struggling to get your master's degree, and you had five children, and you discussed how you know you were you were literally eating food that had been thrown away in order to to feed these children as you were struggling to get your master's degree, and your children at times would and I think this is such an important story to tell about family, um, about a, what it takes for a family to move forward, not just an individual, but a family. Your children would sometimes in despair because it was hard for them. They were African kids in an American school. They'd been uprooted from, from their backgrounds. They'd been brought here. This was your dream, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. and they would sometimes say, can we go back? Can we go yeah. back to Africa? And you didn't break. Um, and that must have been incredibly difficult as a mother who's, who's tasked with taking care of the hearts of your children who yeah. in that moment just want what is familiar. And, and this life is so hard. The life in America was harder. And you just said, I am a dreamer. Mm. This is my identity. Mm. This is what we're doing as a family. Mm. Can you join me in this dream? Yeah. Can you please join me in this dream? And they, and they would come into the dream with you and then be able to face the next day. And I was so moved by that. And I remember you saying in that same interview that you could physically feel. So when you talk about burying the dream and planting the dream, you know, what, what you had done was taken it and put it in a jar, in a rusty old yeah. can, in a can, yeah. right? And you had then buried, written down what the dream was with the five items and then buried it as you would an umbilical cord with a, yeah. a ritual, with a ceremony. And you said, I could feel my dreams buried in the earth in Africa throbbing. Yeah alive mm. and vivid. I was so moved by that. Mm. Um, and I want to speak to you about, in addition to everything else that you've done, the perseverance, the, the connections that you made, the struggle that you had, the dedication to your work, there's another element. And, and I think it's so important to talk about, and that is spirituality um, yeah. and faith and ritual and mm. um, enchantment, a kind of magic, a sense of connection to the land. I was a little bit surprised when I heard that your degree was in agriculture, because to me, you seem like a preacher, a mystic, a healer, a, a psychiatrist. <laughs> and then you said, and then you said, um, agriculture to you is a spiritual, yes. is spiritual. Connection we, to the earth is spiritual. Yes. So I want to talk about, I want to talk about how, what, a, why women especially need spiritual ritual and i'm and i know that most of the women who are following this are western women and this might be a an idea to them that makes them anxious they might associate it with repressive religion they may have no spirituality in their life whatsoever um but i also cannot guide my life without ritual and mm. without spirit and without the sense of a throbbing living dream yeah um, and there's a quote that you put in your book by somebody who you and i both love parker palmer who said the facts can never be understood except in communion with the imagination. Yes. Um, so 
I'm going to turn that over to you. That was a lot I gave you. And you can answer any one of the things that I spoke about, however you wish. You know, you know, faith and rituals is what grounds us as women. We need some grounding. Uh, Maya Angelou said something so profound. A woman in harmony with herself, with her spirit is like a flowing river. She goes where she will without pretense. And she is prepared to be herself and only herself. It comes from this groundedness that we, we need. Our ancestors have always believed in rituals. Rituals connect us to our creativity. And that's why meditation is so profoundly positive for many Western um, world people. Because when you meditate, you come home to yourself. Mm. And I always ask women, please come home to yourself. It helps you to be in tune with who you are, to be in tune with your spirituality. It's a, it's a silent prayer. So in my everyday life, I have this ritual. I woke up at 4 a.m. and I do what I call fierce writing, writing from the soul. Because I remember that I carry some soul wounding that had been passed on from generations before me. During this pandemic, there is those soul wounding, they come so open, vicious. I get anxiety, I get depression, fear. And so I ground myself through the fierce writing where I write the pain and I don't have to filter it and I just write it. And at the end of the day, then there are questions that are coming. What is really breaking your heart now? And I write that. How best can you bring wisdom into this pain, into this anxiety? What is this pain teaching you right now? And I write, and it grounds me. Somehow I wake up and I go for my morning hikes and I, and I feel more at home. So mentally, physically, spiritually, I am there to face the world. But without those rituals, my, my day is spoiled. Me too. I, I, I always say I, I wake up mentally ill every morning. Yeah. And, 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 then, and then ritual brings me to wellness and then I have a good day. Yes. Um, but without, without the ritual, without the meditation, without the prayer, and for, and for me as well, without the writing, um, a spiritual kind of writing. Yeah. I, I don't mean yeah. writing books. I mean the intimate kind of writing that you're discussing yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a friend named Ebony Janice Moore, and um, she's, a, she's a wonderful teacher and scholar and um, womanist and minister. And she recently started an initiative here in the United States. She's a black woman who's now based out of New Orleans. She was in New York. And it's an initiative for young black women called Dream Yourself Free. Mm. Dream Yourself Free, because her feeling is that this is what needs to happen now to heal um, the, the deep, deep trauma of black American women, mm -hmm. um, girls and women. It's that the conversation can't just be about survival and it can't just be about, um, it can't even just be about how to advance in the world. There has to be sacred space for dreaming um, and that dreaming is healing. Yeah. And I was thinking of her so much as I was reading your book because I had lost track of how many times the word dream yes. showed up on your pages. And your life, I think we have a little bit of a, a prejudice sometimes against dreaming or or what some people might call, um, or visualization or manifestation mm -hmm. that feels mm -hmm. a little bit airy fairy. And you know, you're just relying on, you want a miracle to come into your life. I don't think anybody would believe that after reading your book because the amount of blood and sweat and tears that you added, that you watered the ground of your dream with. Yeah, yeah. With, with literal blood, literal sweat and literal tears. And yet without the dream and the sense of it being alive and being fed by spirit, you never would have been able to get to where you got to. Yeah. So, so when I talk about 
um, dreaming and visualizing the life that I wanted. I was, I'm not talking about this miracle of manifestation. I'm talking about what is it that would ground me in these moments of my adversity. I needed grounding. I needed faith. But on top of that, I had to sweat. I had to be the midwife to my own awakening. And it mm. took a lot of work on my, on my part. But also, you know, I also say that to women, you need to be surrounded by mentors, by those who believe in you as well. I had my grandmother, my mother, and the women in the village, the women who are steeped more into the culture of who we are as Africans. And I, and I, and I needed their wisdom, and that's what carried me on. Can you define the word so, sawira for us? So, um, so, I'm sure I'm pronouncing it wrong. But no, you are pronouncing Is that what so, you're talking about? You are pronouncing it so right. Sawira is a friend for life. So I always say surround yourself with sawiras, the, the women or even men who believe in you, whom you can tell whatever you want to. And we, we, back home, we call them my, 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 my garbage can. <laughs> the person that I can tell whatever is on my heart. And I know yeah. that they are not going to be telling or sharing all that because when, when you become my Sawira, you become my sacred sister. Mm -hmm. And we need those kind of relationships in our life. And women, as we come together collectively, we can change this world because we have this feminine energy, this wisdom that we are born with, innate wisdom that can shift and reshift and recreate the world as we know it for the good. I have a question. Um, you have used the word rich to describe your childhood. Um, at the same time as using the word poor in two very different realms, mm -hmm. um, materially poor, economically poor, oppressed in a colonial system, in a racist system, in a patriarchal system, mm -hmm. um, a great deal of sort of the, the structure of the world around you, um, the, I would say very much the male structure of the world around yeah. you was, was deeply in, um, entrenched poverty. Yeah. And yet you also use the word rich to describe what you just spoke of here, the feminine, the depth of feminine wisdom, love, um, the, the deep, deep knowledge of your mother and your grandmother that was passed along to you and the sense of their, the true depth of their love for you and their belief in your dreams, even from beyond the grave, mm. um, that, that these are now spirits who are guiding you. Um, I know many women here in the West who grew up in exactly the reversal, where there may have been material, if not material wealth, at least material adequacy, right? There was no, mm -hmm. there was no risk of starvation. They had a roof over their head. Um, they had material comforts, but they grew up in households perhaps that were spiritually bankrupt, um, where there was no love um, coming from a parent, or perhaps there was addiction, or perhaps there uh, was, were broken psychological relationships, a lot of wounding between mothers and daughters is something that I think is very common um, to see in our culture. In fact, it's rare not to. Mm -hmm. And one question that I had for you, because you draw so much of your strength from that certainty that was grounded in the love and the wisdom of your, the love, wisdom, and respect that you had for your mother and your grandmother and your female ancestors going back forward, backward. Do you have um, thoughts, having lived in America for as long as you did, on how women who didn't have that might be able to find access to that deep well of feminine knowledge and, and power that you speak of so beautifully and so intimately? So thank you for that question because I get that question a lot. So the word mother does not necessarily mean your biological mother. You can find a mother you can find a grandmother, you can find 
these wisdom whisperers, they are everywhere. You, Elizabeth Gilbert, you are one of the wisdom whisperers. If we can tap into your energy, if I were a woman who never received that wisdom from my ancestors or who is facing this breakdown of relationship with my mother or with my daughters, I would come to women like you. Women like you are everywhere. We have to find them. They don't have to be necessarily celebrities. Let's tune into these mothers and grandmothers that are amongst us. When they speak, they speak power to the truth. And when you sit with them and listen, you walk away knowing you have been touched by something bigger. And we, we have to be more intentional finding these women. That is such a beautiful answer. Thank you. You, um, you are that. Oh. <laughs> you are that for, for thousands, for thousands of people in the world. I've got two more questions for you, and then I, I promise I'll let you go, even though I don't want to. Um, <laughs> one, one question that I have is, um, are you in Zimbabwe right this moment? Um, so so I live, you know, I live in Zimbabwe, yeah. but we, um, I came here thinking that, you know, I came in March, uh, oh, end oops. of March, <laughs> thinking that I'll be, I'll just come in for an event and I'll go back and then I got closed off. And so I am here. Um, I, 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 I miss, I miss home, but, um, you know, America will always be home for me because um, my kids are also here. They are attending schools here. And I, I have been embraced and loved by American women. And uh, I have more Sawiras uh, here in America. And I can, I can still call America home. Your home here in America is a troubled home right now. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, also on the brink of what we hope um, is, a, is a tremendous moment of change. Um, there have been many tremendous moments of change in American history, and it does feel like there's one now. And many of us hope and pray that it is. I wondered if you had, um, if you had any observations or advice um, watching what's happening with the Black Lives Matter movement, watching what's happening with the election, watching what's happen, um, happening with, with COVID-19. 2020, is a, there's a lot to talk about, but um, drawing on what you've lived through um, from Rhodesia to Zimbabwe mm. to America, um, what are you seeing um, and, and what can you offer us for hope and what, uh, and, and what uh, can you offer us for warnings? You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I am, uh, you know, I am not the, the wisest person. Uh, all, I can, <laughs> all I can, all I can say, all I can say is that every generation that accepts silencing in the face of gender inequality, in the face of xenophobic, in, this, in the face of homophobic systemic racism. It's a generation that is passing that silencing to the next generation. They are passing it on to their own children and grandchildren. Systemic racism, is well and alive in America. And we have to confront who we are as Americans, and especially the women, because we are the midwives for the good that we want to see in the world. Not putting a bigger responsibility on you, but a spiritual responsibility to say, can we confront the systemic racism and can we be part of the solution? We can't sit here and say, oh, poor America, we are victims. No, we are not. Oh, we certainly we are, not. are part <laughs> of this. We are part of the solution. And we have to be there for one another. Why do we live in America where the black sisters and black brothers are marginalized and oppressed every day. 
why do we live in America where some have benefited from white privilege and yet we don't want to face it? I think we have this moral obligation to be there for one another. The Native Americans of this world, they have taught us something. Humankind has not woven the web of life we are but one thread within it. Whatever we do to the web, we do it ourselves. All things are bound together. All things are connected. And now we see it with the rise of these protests that it's also affecting everyone. So I think, America, you are in a good place because you can say these things and I truly feel that I have seen white, black, brown coming together in a way that I never dreamt to see. And it's such a beautiful thing. And so we all need to go and vote for the truth. That's all I can advise, America. <laughs> vote for your truth. I was going to ask you as my final question, um, I was going to say... Uh, this community that's grown up um, around this Instagram page is a community of, of incredibly big hearted, generous, loving, compassionate, mostly women. I love yeah. the men who are there too, but it's, it's mostly women and, um, and, and they're good. They're a good, good bunch. They are, um, they are a so, so we're a, yes, <laughs> collection, so we're a, yes. a, a so we're a collection of sisters and, and they, they're, what I think unites us um, all in this community is a desire to, to do the right thing, mm. to do the next right thing. And so every time I've had an author on to this page recently, I've asked if there was one thing, if there was one thing that you could ask all of us to do that, would, that you think would be beneficial to, to the world, what would that one thing be? And um, we will take notes and we will do it. So, um, so whatever it is that you, that you say, whether it's, whether it's spiritual, political, economic, or all three, um, we are listening with all of our hearts. So, so I have, I, I just have one, one thing that I, you know, I, I, I want you to ground yourself in the theme. I see you. I am here to be seen. In in Southern Africa, we when strangers meet, they greet one another, and I write it in my book. They say, Sawona, I see you. And the other person says, Ngikona, I am here to be seen. <laughs> I am here to be seen with my vulnerabilities, with my poverty, with my values, with everything positive that you can think of. If we can just see one another, and be there for one another. And I ask women with big platforms to embrace those without platforms so they can uplift their voices. We need women to reclaim their voices because the silencing of black, brown women is our collective silencing. And I truly beg you to see one another as Americans. And how do we see one another? Creating these platforms for one another, or voting for what's good for our society. That's how we can see one another. Buying from black and brown projects. They have businesses, they have books. Buy from them, promote them. Because as you can see, many have these beautiful, well-written books, but you don't see them getting onto that number one, getting onto that first prize or whatever. You don't yeah. see those books from black, brown people. Yeah. And yet, when we don't support black, brown sisters and brothers, we are saying we who are different from them are smarter and intelligent. But that's not the truth. We are all smart. We are all intelligent. We need opportunities. 
And so when I read most of the stuff that you do on Instagram and, and on your platform, I ululate. I go, no, 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 <laughs> Speaking to the spiritual world to say, here comes a woman who knows what the world should be like and giving a platform to other women to thrive. That's what's making you a successful woman, Elizabeth Gilbert. <laughs> Dr. Tara Trent, you make me blush, you make me cry, you make me happy, you make me feel like the world is a good world and I love you with all my heart. Oh, me too. Really, yes, thank you. And I can't wait till the day when I can see you in person again and, and get one of your famous hugs again. <laughs> we, will, we will very soon. We will very soon. Thank you for promoting my book. Everybody, thank you. please read The Awakened Woman by Dr. Taria Trent. It's, it's, uh, it is, um, it's everything. Um, Tara, you are a gift and a miracle. And I thank you so much for giving us your valuable time, your wisdom and your love. And we will try to use it wisely. And oh, thank we'll you. Keep going. Thank, you for this, <laughs> thank you for this and opportunity. Everybody, thank you. Give Dr. Tara I Trent a hand for her very first Instagram live interview. Oh yeah. We like you did it. You've done harder <laughs> things than this in your life. And uh, and you did this one too. And that's another thing you can check off your list of dreams. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> Though I don't know what's happening with my internet. Seriously, I, I don't. Yeah. These things are beyond our control. They're not meant for us to know. <laughs> oh, thank you very, very much. Yeah. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, good. so, your, you know, they, you know, your friends, your Sawiras can follow me on, on Instagram. And they Please can, do. I'll, they I'll can... put all the information and I'll send people to you. And anytime... Anytime you have something to say, you text me and we'll do this again. Oh, um, and, thank you. And, and that is an open invitation for oh, all time. And beautiful. if you're in Zimbabwe in a different time, I will wake up in the middle of the night and do this you, with all happiness. You are so beautiful. <laughs> you are so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I love I you. That. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank oh, you. Thank I you love you story. too. Thank you. Mm. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Bye. Now, sweetie.